Okay, we're back for another episode of Yogi's on the Road. Uh, I haven't heard the music in a while. I kind of missed it a little bit. It never bit. gets old. Yeah, I loved it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back with our teacher, uh, Guy Donahue, and with Alexis and me, Giuseppe. Hello, hi, Guy. Hi, hi Giuseppe. Hey. Hello. <laughs> okay, so today we have a couple of things planned. Um, we wanted to start talking about the three paths of yoga. Right, Guy? Right. Okay, what's um, what's up with those? <laughs> right, so last week we were talking about um, the two meanings of the word yoga. Uh, yoga as an experience, yoga as uh, samadhi, and yoga as a path, as a, as a method or means to achieve the samadhi. And um, there are three main uh, paths, uh, three main routes, um, to the uh, samadhi experience, which are known as uh, Raja Yoga, uh, Karma Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. There are many other sub-paths which are included within those three, but these are the three uh, principal methods. And these three methods are suitable to particular individuals as well. In practice, um, uh, we incorporate aspects of each one um, in any one path that we might be following. So the primary path of um, Patanjali is called Raja Yoga, or Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga is uh, the path through the mind, path through meditation, discrimination. And then uh, Karma Yoga is the path of action. And subcategories of karma yoga are ashtanga yoga, hatha yoga. And then the path of devotion is bhakti yoga. And subcategories of bhakti yoga would be uh, mantra yoga and uh, um, other devotional practices. Seva, like giving service. Yeah, seva could be giving service, or it could also be karma yoga in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. So they all merge in a certain sense anyway. Um, the ultimate path or the supreme path is the path of Raja Yoga and the paths of uh, Karma and Bhakti Yoga in a certain sense merge into Jnana, merge into knowledge. Um, Do you have a sense of why Raja Yoga is the highest? Like what makes that one more supreme than somebody who is devotional or... Somebody who's doing good actions. Well, the meaning of yoga or the culmination of yoga is self-knowledge, knowledge, knowledge mm -hmm. of the true supreme self. And uh, in order to um, obtain that knowledge, uh, one requi it's requ one, uh, it is required to be uh, to have a certain detachment, to have a certain uh, insight, discrimination, and so on. Um, so this is uh, really only possible for somebody who has um, uh, less attachment, who is, um, uh, we could say, intelligent, sattvic in nature. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, the path of devotion or the path of action are more suitable to people who, let's say for the path of uh, karma yoga, is uh, suitable for those with uh, quite a lot of stress, that applies yeah. to pretty much everybody today. So um, the most popular path of yoga today is uh, uh, Hatha Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga, uh, path of action. Yeah, because Asanas. it's in a world with karma. We're in a world, of, people who we're in a world of stress. Yeah. So um, More attachment. And more attachment. Yeah. And then uh, the path of um, Bhakti Yoga, the path of devotion, is uh, really for those who... Um, have a lot of attachments who can then just totally devote themselves to one thing. Um, and in a certain sense, uh, you know, the path of jnana yoga is, requires both uh, practice, abhyasa, and vairagya. Abhyasa and vairagya. Vairagya means non-attachment. Yeah, the falling away of worldly desires. And... Um, For those who have strong attachments, 
um, the uh, the path to self knowledge requires the um, attachment to something that is pure, something that is uh, going to move you in that direction. So basically, what you do mm-hmm. is you trans transfer your attachments from yeah. um, sex and drugs and rock and roll yeah. onto a guru, yeah. onto um, uh, it's like a it's kind of like a segue or like a bridge. Exactly. Like you have a really you have an attachment to something really lame and then you have something to less lame and then the last attachment to go is the attachment to self actualization. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then bhakti so the bhakti path that's for people like would would an example of bhakti yoga be some attachment to like family? You know, it would be an example of bhakti practice for tamasic people. Um, well, I guess in some sense, you know, in India they say, you know, the mother and father are the first gurus. Um, there's a very strong devotion uh, to to the parents. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, husband and wife very often yeah. have very strong feelings of devotion, um, seeing God in, in the other. So, yeah, yeah, I think that could be. But technically speaking, I don't think that's really the bhakti path is really, um, uh, you know, performing pujas and uh, um, having devoted practice, which is uh, connected to a spiritual teacher, a guru. I see. Um, and uh, serving that guru, serving that path, and hoping that uh, you will be moved along in the direction towards the divine um, by your attachment. So it's a way of um, oh, disconnecting from the things which uh, cause you pain, uh-huh. uh, and then it's it's interesting because it's not really detachment. Yeah, you're still keeping the experience of attachment. You've just transferred your attachment onto something else that exactly. is good for you. Yeah. So raga means attachment, and vairagya yeah. means to move away from or to move it towards something else. Uh-huh. So you're not letting go of your attachment. You're not letting go of your passion. You're just putting your passion on something which uh, moves you in the right direction. Yes. And it actually, is, it's impossible to cut off your attachments. Yeah, I was just saying, like, on a very basic level, is it just like replacing, quote unquote, one addiction with the other? Just a lot. Of, I feel that, like, a lot of people, for instance, that go into sp- spiritual path or yoga path or s- something like that, have a past maybe of you know, other types of abuses and then they sort of like translate it into a positive attachment. Like, we you know, we wake up every day at, you know, 6.30, come to practice, practice it, and we sort of get attached to that as well. Absolutely. If you have a, 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 a nature which is addictive, then uh, moving from a drug, uh, you will attached then to a practice or to a person who will make you feel good you know you get a you know like a healthy positive high uh, so absolutely but um you know the path of karma yoga for it to be really effective uh one needs to perform action without attachment to the results so that's the key yeah. if you're attached to the results you're going to get from your practice like a, you know a nice body or um, be attractive to a member of the opposite sex or something like that then of course you're just going to be led to misery or maybe you're attached to a particular posture or learning a particular posture or a practice or something like that these things uh, will actually lead you to uh, to more suffering but at the same time I, I, i'm the i'm the basic uh, questions person <laughs> <laughs> that's the trend but at the same time is it like nice sometimes when you do go forward like in your practice like what is the line the fine line you know between uh these two sort of feelings like i i tr- you know i try to practice and it doesn't really matter you know what i do or where i go but at the same time when i get a new asana or when i get something when i f- unlock something i'm happy so what's what's the fine line you know absolutely um how are you going to be motivated you need some motivation in the first place and we start off with very tangible, concrete uh, facts that we're looking towards. Uh, I think if you if you think about the goal of asana practice uh, as being um, a preparation for being comfortable sitting and meditating, then you can 
legitimately uh, feel pleasure in moving your body from feeling uh, less comfortable, more toxic, towards feeling more open, more relaxed, more um, more ready to actually sit and meditate. Um, but uh, of course, there's a danger that uh, you know you you just grasp hold of. Uh, the thing that is getting you there rather than focus on uh, where you're actually trying to go. You know, it's like the finger pointing at the moon. You know, you're focused on the, on the finger, obsessed with the finger, and you forget about what is it pointing towards? What's the purpose? What's the point? Surely. And uh, I think it's, a, you know, it's actually a beautiful trick that uh, is integrated into the yoga practice, <laughs> which... Um, allows you to be motivated to achieve something. And then at a certain point, you you also have a lot of disappointments. You also have your ups and downs, which parallel life outside the yoga room uh, as, uh, you know, you go through divorce and uh, um, get sick or whatever, lose your job and you experience misery. And then, uh, you know, that gets paralleled um, probably in your yoga practice. And so... That beautiful posture that you could do a year ago, you can no longer achieve it. And uh, so letting go of the attachment is also a very important part. Attachment is necessary to get you there. It's like a hook that brings you forward. Um, and then we need it to be educated. And uh, the counter side of pleasure is pain. The counter side of attachment is uh, uh, feeling the pain, yeah, yeah, feeling the pain when you no longer have uh, what you worked so hard to achieve. Yeah, totally. I remember uh, just a couple of days ago, you told me pain is a good teacher, you know, and that kind of like stuck with me, and it's it's true. But we talked about it also with Yossi a few episodes ago, mm -hmm. you know, pain being a great teacher, you know, and just working with it, you know, and I think you always have a choice, like, you know, you can, like, f fall in the pain and just, like, think everything is against you or, like, use that to, like, unlock, you know, what's what's beyond that, what's beyond the pain, what's after, in a way, I think. Sure. I mean, I often find that um, I only start to become effective as a teacher when uh, the student, uh, with certain students, <laughs> like, you tell them again and again, like, this is the right way, this is a good way, uh, think about your breathing, think about uh, et cetera, et cetera, and they just kind of ignore you. And then uh, suddenly one day they're in a lot of pain, and then you say, okay, let's go back to basics. And then suddenly the lessons really start to make sense for them. Um, one teacher said uh, pain is uh, um, an acute point of attention. It makes you very aware yeah. of... Uh, what you're doing and how <laughs> to do it and how to be careful and how to Freeman. not hurt yourself. Yeah. yeah. Because basically, you know, the first principle of Ashtanga Yoga is ahimsa, non-harming. Uh, non and uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the very first principle. How will you practice asanas without hurting yourself? Yeah, it was Yossi. Yossi was discussing it said that pain is an indication of um, ignorance, that we're not aware of ways that we've been harming ourselves, and so then it, it becomes a signal for us in the asana practice. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, I was thinking about the what you were saying just a few minutes ago. Um, sometimes you unlock something in your practice, and it sort of like unlocks something mm -hmm. in your daily life or vice versa like there is always a connection between i don't know like what's what goes on in your life and what goes on in practice from a physical or from like a spiritual or from mind point of view and you know if your mind is very busy with something you um you can maybe unlock that through your body i mean eventually it's all connected just like all the paths of yoga i mean you need everything right sure what's the tool that you use in life it's your mind and body and uh, when you're practicing asanas when you're practicing yoga uh, you are very carefully um, working with your mind and body so it's a little microcosm 
um, how do you behave in the situation where you are intently focused on what you're doing very precisely with your body and how does that teach you um, how to use those tools in life itself and how when you injure yourself in life or when you have distress uh, it then reflects in your practice so yeah I see I see um, asana practice as being a kind of little laboratory a little uh, mini reflection of life itself and there's many things you can learn um, some years ago uh, I was working with a, a mechanic a car mechanic uh, my car kept breaking down um, and uh, he, he, uh, I had a friend who had also taught a little bit of yoga too, and he said, and I kept getting him to fix my car for me. And he said, you know what, you need, you need to learn how to do this yourself because you know you just keep having so many problems with this with, with this vehicle. And so um, I agreed and started studying with him and learning <laughs> with him, and actually ended up starting to work with him as a car mechanic. And um, he had uh, learnt his mechanics on a farm and uh, a place where they would always, you know, they'd make pieces that, you know, they didn't have the correct parts to replace. So they would just uh, um, create something in the, in the, in the, in the uh, workshop and sort of stick it all together with uh, bits of string and uh, sellotape kind of thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and if there was a problem, Instead of uh, getting a manual, he'd come with a big hammer and he'd kind of smash this uh, the problem up, you know. And it was very interesting how we, we developed this kind of uh, relationship through mechanics and yoga and how I was able to teach him how to breathe and relax and look at the problem, go buy a <laughs> manual. <laughs> Instead of going to the breaker's yard to go and find a second-hand part, uh, in a car and then bring it back and see if it would work and spend seven or eight hours getting that part. We could just go to the shop and buy a new part. We could even buy, you know, like a, a generic part which costs less than the Volkswagen or whatever we were trying to uh, work on. And so I brought in to him, he taught me about mechanics and I kind of taught him about a yogic approach or just an intelligent approach to uh, fixing cars. It was quite an, quite an interesting, interesting relationship that we ended up having. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's cool. Because, I mean, that, that proves that, like, yoga is practical. It's not Absolutely. just for, you know, being on top of a mountain and, you know, meditating for 14 years and not breathing or all the stuff that, you know, we hear. It's It can be also on a day-to-day -day here in New York City and um, it can be part of just like our busy, stressed life. Absolutely. It's very practical. It makes you uh, more effective in all the things that you do. Yeah, no doubt. Mm, interesting. Because that was one of the questions that we had. It was how, how do you balance, you know, the day-to-day -day and like a strong yoga practice? Um, I guess, I mean, how, how do we expand on that, you know? Um, that question, it seems like it could, like a person could react in different ways. Like if they were going to respond with bhakti yoga, then they could, you know, offer up the fruits of their labor and stay in the w world. If they were going to do karma, they would act in a different way. If they were going to do raja yoga, there would be a lot of like discernment in their yoga practice. Well, I think the fact is um, we tend to incorporate aspects of all three of the uh, different main paths of yoga in our practice. So, for instance, um, you know, the, the highest path is called uh, jnana yoga um, or raja yoga. Um, but without any kind of devotion, or without any kind of reverence for life itself, for the physical body, mm -hmm. uh, for your... Uh, family and uh, contemporaries, etc. Without that connection, um, you're not going to go very far. And in the same way, without uh, dealing with practical necessities, uh, without dealing with feeding your body, without dealing with how much sleep you need, um, how to provide for your family, etc., etc., 
Uh, you're not going to go very far on the path of uh, jnana, yoga, without attending to those two things as well. Equally, if you are totally devoted to the path of uh, action, uh, you're not going to get very far unless uh, it also is uh, infused with some intelligence if it doesn't have some kind of devotional aspect to it as well. So all three are, are necessary. Um, how do you balance life and yoga? Uh, this is a very important question. You know, if you go too deep into yoga and don't take care of the um, necessities of life, then uh, it's not really you're yoga. Gonna you're gonna well, you're gonna end up suffering yeah. a lot. Uh, and equally, if you go, you know, if you just uh, are a hedonist and enjoy life to the maximum extent without contemplating on your true nature, you will equally you will yeah. suffer. And for each person, it's a very unique uh, balance. Everyone's very different. So some people are born uh, with very little attachment, um, with a strong feeling for their inner spirit, uh, very motivated uh, to finding deep peace. Other people are born with attachment to lots of pleasures uh, or with a lot of stress. Um, and either they have a, a deep need for um, redirecting, redirecting that addictive pleasure-seeking nature uh, through a, a kind of religious uh, approach, or they need to work very hard to get rid of the stress out of their system. So mm. some people who work extremely hard uh, outside of the yoga practice will then also have to work very, very hard in the yoga practice just to get that pain and stress out of their bodies. Like right. if you spend 10 hours on the trading on the stock exchange, then probably uh, you also need to do a fairly intense asana practice. Whereas if you were um, doing a job that was very mellow and relaxed and uh, that was also your nature, um, then maybe your yoga practice could just be meditating and uh, you wouldn't really need to, you know, get rid of the stress from your system because you'd already be naturally at peace. So every person's situation is very different. Interesting. But of course there's also, um, you know, we're all living in New York City, for instance. Not everyone who's listening is living in New York City, but for all of us, no matter what kind of profession you might have, or what kind of life circumstances, whether you have seven kids so you don't have any children at all, or you have a stressful job, or you're unemployed, or you're a musician, or whatever, um, we still all live in this kind of toxic environment where there's a lot the of... The teacher of pain. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the primary path for all of us probably is going to be karma yoga, is going to be a, a path through action uh, in order to eliminate the stress that we all experience. So, you know, the path of action can move either towards jnana, it can move uh, towards knowledge, or it can move more towards a kind of religious feeling, you know, that typically each individual has an inclination in one direction or the other. So those who are, like we said in the beginning, had a more addictive type of nature, they will tend to be more addicted to the asana practice and the, and the results in physical terms um, and maybe to a teacher or a teaching, they will tend to become a little bit obsessive. Um, they, you know, maybe their, their practice becomes a little bit... Uh, um, obsessive? Obsessive and not particularly healthy. Yeah. Um, whereas the real target should be knowledge. So all three paths actually culminate in knowledge. Uh, that's, that's the intention. That's mm -hmm. the idea. Cool. Interesting. Uh, well, I th uh, do you want to add anything regarding the three paths of yoga? Or maybe we can take a little break and then we come back uh, with the new stuff that we want to talk about. Cool. All right. We'll do that. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank I'll see you. you in a few minutes. <laughs> I think we made it through around, you know. It's so good. Yeah. It's so good. It's kind of like a, a show. That